Okay, okay. So uh, here we are once again, ready to get started on a new lesson. Uh, for this evening, the idea is that we're going to be covering information. Oh, wait, so here we go. So yeah, um, welcome, welcome. And as I was saying, for this evening, we are supposed to wrap it up with the information that we were covering yesterday regarding the passive voice. Uh, we're going to be closing that up. Uh, we also have uh, um, the chance of talking about pronunciation a bit, which has to do with the letter O and how um, this letter can be pronounced in different ways, depending on what are the words or letters that are around this word. So that's going to be a big part of what we're going to be working on this evening. Um, we also have another version of uh, the of passive voice. That's another thing that we're also going to be covering. But there is something that I forgot to mention yesterday that is very important. And it's the fact that for these lessons, I like to have at the beginning of the of each lesson a time for you guys to practice. So I think I sort of mentioned it, but I didn't specify like how it's gonna work. Um, uh, but the way it's gonna be working is that at the beginning, on the first, I don't know, maybe the first 10 minutes of every class, you are going to have the chance to answer to a question that I will be providing. Of course there are going to be chances or occasions when maybe you guys are going to have the you know the opportunity to ask the questions yourselves but well for their very first classes the way it's going to work is going to be like that me asking you guys questions and um, well the questions are going to be simple it's not going to be anything too complicated we're going to start with the most you know easy things and then maybe we're going to grow into harder or more atypical questions but the idea is that we get to practice. The idea is that we get to share and, uh, you know, that we have the chance to um, to practice more, to use our vocabulary or to use our English, at least for a few minutes at the beginning of the lesson. Now, another thing that we're going to work tonight is going to be a conversation. So we're going to start with that as well. Um, normally, with, when conversations take place, we're going to be switching to the breakout rooms. So please be ready for that because that's part of what we're going to do. We're going to move into the breakout rooms to practice the conversations. Um, and tonight we have the first one, which means that, of course, we're going to be doing that as well. Ahora, una cosa que les quería comentar, y eso también lo voy a hacer en español porque es importante que quede 100% claro, tiene que ver con esto de los, de los breakout rooms o las, las prácticas que tengamos así con conversaciones. Eh... No sé ustedes anteriormente si han trabajado alguna vez en, en estos break rooms o los grupos pequeños, pero en caso que no lo hayan hecho, eh, es una forma que utilizaremos para estar practicando, ¿verdad? Para hacerlo de una forma un tanto más privada, digamos, y así también un poco más ágil, porque en grupos pequeños será mucho más sencillo el poder trabajar eh, pues más rápido y poder tener a todos siendo parte de la, de la actividad. Pero la situación es que cuando nos vamos a, a, a los break rooms, yo no les puedo estar compartiendo pantalla a todos ¿verdad? al mismo tiempo. Entonces, lo que vamos a estar haciendo será lo siguiente. Vamos a tratar de tener una captura, ya sea en el teléfono o en su computadora, a la hora que estemos verdad, a punto de irnos al break room, una captura específica de lo que sería la conversación. Entonces, sacamos esa captura y ya después... Eh, lo que vamos a hacer es que uno de las personas que esté dentro de, um, ¿cómo se llama? Dentro de, del breakout room específico va a poder tener la oportunidad de compartir su pantalla para que el resto de los compañeros también tengan la oportunidad, pues, de visualizar, ¿verdad? Eh, esa conversación y así poder practicarla todos juntos. Eso lo vamos a practicar en un ratito. O sea, es bastante sencillo. Simplemente ustedes hacen la captura. Ahí, ¿verdad? En, su, um, en sus configuraciones de Zoom aparecerá una flecha verde que es la que van a utilizar para compartir y pues de ahí ustedes seleccionan, ¿verdad? La imagen. En el caso que lo hagan desde la computadora es un proceso un poquito diferente porque van a tener que, um, van a tener que digamos, eh, compartir desde una página de Word, pero igual. 
funciona. So yeah, that's going to be part of what we're going to do because as I said, um, as much as we practice or the more we practice, the better. So yeah, we're going to be um, doing these conversations and uh, the practice at the beginning, which is, as I said, a, um, you know, a question for you guys to go ahead and, and uh, like basically warm up the English um, before we get started. So uh, this evening, the question is very simple. It's nothing too complicated. It's simply, how are you doing? So that's where I need to, to answer. And I feel like I'm going to start by asking maybe Rodrigo Hernandez. So in your case, Rodrigo, how are you doing tonight? Hello, Hello there. Good night. I'm I I I I need to feel very more because uh, in the weekend uh I have I have uh uh very heaven in my in my in my job. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's see someone else. Let's maybe hear from um, Rodrigo Mendoza. In your case, Rodrigo, how are you doing tonight? Uh, hi, teacher. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm fine. Uh, I'm very tired in this moment because uh, I work until late. Um, for example, every... I, I work from 7 a.m. o'clock to, to 5 p.m. o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I work for a call center, but it's in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, I listen the call of the agent, and I, I do different activities. Uh, but I have a good day, and, and, I, and I hope to learn in this class. All right. Great. Very good. Nice. I, in your case, I got, you know, I got to hear an answer that I wanted to hear because um, there is a complication that sometimes we have when we face that question. But just give me one second. I'm going to go to another person and then I'm going to come back to finish my comments. Um, how about in the case of Jonathan Marroquin? How about you, Jonathan? How are you doing? Ooh, wait, I can't hear you. I see your mouth moving. Oh, there we go. All right. Hi. Good evening, Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I feel so a little tired from work and the traffic, but I'm so excited to be here and to learn. All right. Great. So good. Very good. Great. Nice. Very, very nice. So I feel like I am getting there. You know, I am getting to hear what I want to hear. How about in the case of um, Ever? Ever Antonio, how are you doing tonight? Hello, Ever. Oh, there we go. Hello, hello. Well, I noticed you opened your mic for a bit, but it was just a short time. Well, maybe we can get to hear from Karen. How about you, Karen? How are you doing tonight? Oh, wait, your microphone is off. There we go. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, I'm doing great tonight. Um, good night, everybody here. Night. Um, I'm a little bit tired today. I had um a lot of well several meetings and um several things to do, and um well I'm I'm feeling hungry right now. Okay. I'm just thinking what I'm going to eat once the class is finished, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm great. Okay, nice, nice, nice to know. All right, so what I was going to say before is that, um, you know, I have seen many people struggle with the question that I just asked you, which is, how are you doing? I have seen so many people that um, when they are asked, how are you doing? They come to reply, for example, I'm in a class or they come to reply, I'm going home and things like those. And it's because 
a mistake takes place when they hear the question because people understand the question, how are you doing? As if I was asking, what are you doing? So it there's a difference, of course, um, in between asking how and what. Now, um, there are many questions as well, many options of questions that you can um, use when you want to know how a person is feeling or how the day of someone is, somebody is going at a specific time. The one that I just used is a very basic and common one because, uh, well, many, many people use this one, you know, um, how, um, I'm oh, sorry, um, use this question, you know, just, just maybe to be polite, not necessarily because they care too much about your feelings, but it's just a way in which you can start a conversation. Um, another option you can use apart from how are you doing can be the basic one, the most basic one, which is simply, how are you? You know, that's a, um, probably a staple that every single English class is, I'm going to include a, how are you in a point? Because yeah, that's like the most basic way in which you can ask, ask people how they are doing. Now, there are many other ways, like for example, you have um, something like the question, how's life? I don't know if you guys have ever uh, faced anyone who may ask you, how's life? This question is not necessarily the same. It's very similar, but it's not necessarily the same. The context can make it vary. Because for example, if you are asking this to someone you haven't seen in a long time, what you want to hear as an answer is basically a summary of the things that this person has been up to in the time when you haven't seen each other. So think if, uh, for example, you face your ex, um, you know, your ex-couple, your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, and you ask them, how's life? So what you're going to uh, expect in reply is going to be something like, okay, I have been, you know, doing this, doing this or other sort of things, and like a short summary of how things are going. So um, another one that we can use can be, for example, um, how's everything? How's everything is, once again, it can be used simply to reply, oh, I'm doing great, I'm okay, you know, any of the options you guys prefer to use. However, this can also have to do with a specific business that exists in between the two of you. Like if, for example, um, you know that this person has I don't know, a family member who is sick and you know that this person has been, you know, worried about that and uh, you want to know, but without being too direct into asking um, about the person, you can ask, how is everything? And that's like an open question that provides you like a chance, you know, to get to that, to get to at the end, um, have an idea of how this person is doing, referring that situation, referring to that situation. Of course, this is another um, context in which you can use it, in which um, you can ask someone, how's everything? When, for example, they are people who work for you. Um, let's say that um, you have a business and you simply want to check, up, uh, check out on your business and see you know, how everything has been going. So that's another um, context in which you can use the phrase or the, or the question, how is everything? You are not expecting your employee to reply, oh, I'm doing great, boss. You're expecting your employee to tell you like, um, well, it has been busy the whole morning and, you know, we have sold this and this and this amount of things. So that's the context in which you are going to be using um, these sort of questions. Yeah, we also have that one. Thank you, Karen. Um, how's, how's it going? That's another one in which uh, it's a very... How can we say it? like a like a very day to day sort of question? Like you can ask it to people that you know, people you relate to, and um, you know it's simply like a way for you to like update on the people, update on on their lives and how they're doing. Now there is also one question that is very I will, I don't want to say professional, but kind of like formal. It's like one of the most formal ways in which you can ask someone on how they are doing or how they have been doing because it's how have you been um this one is mostly used when you are like in um in meetings or you know seeing people who are um probably in a higher position than you 
and that you want to be respectful towards. So you want them to know that, you know, you're not trying to be casual with them. You're trying to be respectful and you're trying to um, simply go ahead and, and show some respect to their position, to their um, more elevated position when it refers to your actual position. So um, how have you been? That's, you know, a very good option when you go to um, to gatherings or company gatherings, when you're going to be probably going to be able to see managers or people who are in those ranges. Um, so, yeah, how have you been? That's, you know, one of the options. Now, of course, there are always going to be options for the answers. And uh, when it comes to that, there are two things that I don't like people doing and or that I don't like my students or people that I have met doing. And one of them is using the word good. Like whenever somebody asks you, you know, how are you or how are you doing or any of these options. Um, the reason why I don't feel like simply saying good is a good way of going about it is that it shows some sort of, um, what you call it? Maybe like, uh, you don't show any interest in the conversation. When you simply reply good, it means that you know you're being short in your answers and you don't you're being too sharp and you don't want the conversation to continue. You can use it, of course, when you're talking to someone who you don't want to talk, or maybe someone who approaches you and you don't you don't want to have a conversation with this person. You can simply reply, Oh yeah, good. Well, good. Thank you. That's the most um well, the least polite. Yeah, the least polite way of answering to that question. Good. All good. Thank you. It's simply like telling them, okay, please be quiet. I don't want to talk to you. Uh, instead of simply saying that, you're saying good. All good. Thank you. Uh, but then the one that I, I don't hate it, but I don't like it at all is when people reply, fine. I'm sorry for the one who did, but I don't like it when people say fine. And the reason why is because behind that word, as many, many words in English, there is an, a hidden or a hidden, sorry, a hidden meaning, which is um, the word multa. I don't know if you guys have ever faced that or have ever seen that, but yeah, la palabra fine también significa multa, ¿sí? Significa que, por ejemplo, si ustedes le preguntan a alguien, ¿cómo estás? Bueno, y eso es algo que yo solía hacer bastante cuando trabajaba en la universidad. Eh, a veces, ¿verdad? Sí, de sorpresa, yo les preguntaba a los chicos, hey, how are you? Y si decían fine, pues ellos ya sabían que como a mí no me gusta que me contesten así, tenían que depositar una corita, ¿verdad? Ahí, eh, para, qué sé yo, comprar algo al final de la clase o así. Porque, pues, eso, la palabra fine también se puede utilizar, o más bien, se utiliza para eh, decir multa. Whenever you, for example, exceed a speed limit or maybe are doing something that is wrong, it, not only on the road, but on an institution or uh, at your job, and there are rules that you have to follow, and if you don't follow the rules, well, there is like a sort of payment you have to do, well, that is getting fine. So um, that's why I don't like people using, you know, the word fine. And also because it's too simple. It's too, like, um, narrow when it comes to answering such a question. And you simply say, I'm fine. You know, it's like, once again, simply not showing any desire to continue the conversation. Therefore, it's better for you to use other phrases, like, as you did, you know, uh, maybe saying, oh, I'm doing great or explaining uh, I'm OK, but I feel tired because of this, it isn't that. So that's way better, because in that way you're explaining, you're creating a conversation and, of course, providing the other person a chance to continue on with the, with the conversation. So, yeah, but for future occasions, um, it would be great, you know, if you find a word or a phrase that makes you feel better when you want to answer this sort of thing, because, for example, in my case, the way I will almost always reply when you ask me, how are you? How are you doing? It's simply just hanging in there. You know, that basically means that, you know, I'm, I'm not okay. I'm not bad. It's simply there, there. You know, it's, it's like saying so-so. Saying hanging in there is very similar to saying so-so. But okay. Um, so here we go. We're going to start with uh, where we left off yesterday, which was with the examples. But now we're going to jump right into this which is what I was mentioning at the beginning, the passive, oh, sorry, it, this is the pronunciation of uh, the letter O and the different ways in which you can uh, get to like hear uh, the, the letter O. So letters in English, or more importantly, vowels in English, 
have many different sounds. In Spanish, we are very used to simply hearing five sounds and one for each vowel. But in English, we have around 27 sounds that come from the five vowels. They have the same vowels, but they have 27 sounds that can be um, you know, produced with the vowels depending on the letter that they have right next to them or the word in which they are being used. So for example, the word, the, the letter O, whenever it's used next to letters like uh, T or P that are plosive or explosive uh, letters, it will sound basically the same as in Spanish. So in this occasion, you will have to say something like not or top. So that's very similar to the sound that the letter O has in Spanish. You're not going to be necessarily having to remember any special way of like moving your tongue or accommodating your teeth or maybe um, closing or opening your um, your lips. You're simply going to go with the basic, you know, the letter O, not top when it is next to letters that are explosive letters. Now, we have these other pronunciation, which is in phonetics, uh, known as O. O. Yeah, so this is the one that most people know for the letter O in English. And this is also the way in which the letter is actually supposed to be spelled. When you are writing down the letters, the letter O is supposed to go like this. And when do we use this one? Well, we normally use it normally. Okay, please hear to this. Normally use it when the letter O is free. It means that there are no other letters in front of it. However, there is one uh, or a few um, ways in which it, cha it changes. For example, when it's used next to a letter um, G, it's going to be different. And well, it's actually, to be more honest, it's actually only with the, um, the verb do. That's when it happens. That's when it's going to happen that you're going to have this letter and it's going to sound as an U in Spanish. However, it's not simply U. If you see this um, colon over here, it means that it's an elongated U. So it's not simply U, but U. U. Okay. It's como una U más larga. U. So we have no. No. This is when the letter O is um, free or it doesn't have any other letters right in front. Or when it has letters that are um, softer and that are not necessarily plausible letters like this. For example, the letter N is a softer letter. It's a soft letter that will allow the letter O to have its full on um, sound, which is, well, O. So you have to say something like don't. Don't say simply don't. Don't está mal. Hay muchas personas que yo escucho que dicen don't. That's not okay. It's don't. Don't. Yeah, don't, don't. That's how you're supposed to say it. Don't say don't, but it will be don't. Okay, in a minute, you're going to have the chance to practice this. So please pay attention because I don't want you guys uh, mispronouncing these words either. So we have the next one up. The one when I mentioned that it's like an elongated um, U, you have do, do. It's not do and you cut it, it's do, do. You leave it there for a bit, do. And then we also have this one, which is when we have, uh, well, this is a very common phenomenon in English. And uh, it happens mostly with the vowels E and um, O. And what happens, or the way I want to, I want you guys to remember it is that cuando sea que ustedes encuentren con una letra E duplicada, esta letra E va a pasar, o estas dos letras E más bien, van a pasar a sonar eh, de la misma forma que suena una I en español, ¿sí? Cuando se encuentren con dos letras E, estas van a pasar a sonar de la misma forma en la que suena una letra I en español, o sea, la siguiente vocal. Y cuando ustedes se encuentren dos letras O, que están justo al lado claramente, van a pasar a sonar como si fuese una letra U en español. Entonces, eso es algo, ¿verdad?, que puede ayudarnos a pronunciar diferentes cosas. ¿Habrá alguna excepción por ahí? Puede ser. De momento no tengo ninguna en mente, pero la mayoría de ocasiones cuando ustedes se encuentren con este tipo de, um, de letras, de spellings, va a ser así. Sí. Una doble E suena como una I del español. Una doble O suena como una U del español. Tal vez un poco más alargada, esa será la única diferencia, ¿verdad? Que tiene que ser un poco más alargada. So here, for example, you're going to have to say 
food, food, not food, but food, food. So it's a little bit longer than simply saying food. It's food. Um, another example or an example that can come with this is like, for example, this word. You see, it's a double E, so it's pronounced feet, feet. And here you have a double O, so it will be foot, foot. So this is something that happens quite often in English. For example, this one, feed, feed. Um, it's It doesn't have anything to do with this word, of course. That's something that is important to mention. Feed doesn't have anything to do with food. Food is its own word, its own um, thing. But I just wanted to show you guys that, you know, there are words or many words that have this phenomenon going on. So, yeah. And then we have the last one. This one is very weird because, um, well, in my case, I had to take a phonetics class. And even in that phonetics class, I was never able to pinpoint the specific pronunciation for this symbol. It's supposed to be a plain O. It's supposed to work as a plain O, but with a little bit of a, um, like a longer O sound. Like for example, here, the word one, one. So it's not uh, O1 or, or um, O1, but it's one. So it, it's like a longer O. That's basically what happens. But in some words, you're gonna it's gonna sound a little bit like it has some part of ooh in it. So it's a weird, you know, weird situation going on with it. But still, it's important that you know that uh, the basic way in which you can understand it is that it's like, like a longer o. So one, one, and then we have it also in the in the word love, love. And that is way more clear than in the first one, because here you can act actually um, hear how long it feels, because it's love, love. It's a little bit longer than in one. But still, um, these are some examples uh, of words that have the letter O in the different ways it can be pronounced. Now, I want to hear you guys um, pronouncing these words. So I would like to have, I don't know, maybe one or two volunteers to practice it, and then we can move on into the next thing. So one or two volunteers to practice um, these words. Muy bien, me toca de pesca entonces. Um, so maybe we can hear from Jonathan Marroquín. And... Um... Creo que Julio Castro. So, you too. Jonathan, quisieras... Ready. Yes, okay, great. So, whenever you're ready, you may start. Not. Top. No. Don't. Do. Foot. On. Love. Or right. Love. Love. Uh -huh. Love. Love. And one. One. Uh-huh. Great, very good. That's how you do it. Thank you very much. Um, how about we hear from Julio Castro? Okay. Good evening, teacher. Good evening. Okay, um, I'm starting. Uh, not, top, no, mm. don't, do, food, one, love. Love, okay, great, very good. Thank you very much. All right, so as you see, um, English has these variations, you know, it's part of the language, it's something that we kind of get um, used to when the time comes, uh, because yeah, it's it's a special um, section, I will have to say, about the language. But well, uh, you know that this is a little bit blurry, I hope you guys are going to be able to notice, you know, the letters, porque si se ve un poco borroso, it was very tiny in the platform, so I had to, um, you know, work my way around trying to clarify it. But yeah, this is the first conversation that we're going to practice. As always, conversations are a great option for us to go ahead and, you know, um, use our English because, well, we don't necessarily have to stop and think what we're going to say. We simply have to go with the flow, simply reading what has been said by someone else. And uh, um, all that we have to focus on is basically pronunciation and um, well, the pace at which we speak. So, yeah, pronunciation and fluency are the main 
uh, objectives behind these sort of conversations. And that is the re basic reason why we normally go ahead and um, practice said conversations. So we have here um, two people, Kelly and John. Those are the two um, that are taking place into it. And the conversation is titled, I need some information. So the way it's gonna work is that I'm going to read it one time for you guys. If there is need for me to clarify any of the words that are mentioned in the conversation, please go ahead and ask uh, for any of the ones that maybe you are doubting about. And then I'm going to request two of you guys to participate and read the conversation. By the end of the lesson, when we are about to finish, we're going to move into the breakout rooms to have the practice that I um, anticipated when we started the class. So yeah, that's how it's gonna work. I read it, then um, if you need any, any extra information, any clarification, you can ask for it. And then we have um, you know, two or as many of you guys who volunteer to practice it, we'll go ahead and practice it. And then at the end of the lesson, we're going to go into the breakout rooms to practice it as a whole. So Kelly and John, this is how it's supposed to go. Hello. Oh, hello. I need some information. What currency is used in European Union? Where? The European Union. I think the Euro is used in most of the EU. All right. And is English is spoken much there? I really have no idea. Ah, uh, well, what about credit cards? Are they accepted everywhere? How would I know? Well, you're a travel agent, aren't you? What? This is a hair salon. You have the wrong number. Okay, so that's the conversation. Now, do you guys uh, need to clarify any of the words or any of the phrases that are used here? Or is everything clear for you? All is clear for me. Okay. Yeah, I feel like, you know, there are no uh, tricky words in this conversation. So, yeah. Very good. So, I would like to have um, two participants. Two of you guys practice it for the rest of the class. And then we're going to move into um, passive without using by. So, um, two participants. Two volunteers, please, to practice the conversation right now. Hi. Okay. Jonathan and Raul. Great. So, Jonathan and Raúl, whenever you're ready, you may start. Well, I am. I'm Kelly here. Okay. Hello. Oh, hello. I need some information. What currency is used in the Europe Union? Europe Where? Union. Where? The, the European Union. Oh, I think the euro, the euro is used in most of the e EU. EU. Mm -hmm. All right. So blurry. All right. And is English spoken much there? I really have no idea. Uh, well, what about credit cards? Are they accepted everywhere? How will I know? Well, you're a travel agent, aren't you? What? This is a higher saloon. You have the wrong number. All right, there we go. Very, very good. So only one thing, uh, be careful with this one. It's, uh, I don't know if I mispronounced it because I'm not certain if I did, but it's salon. Because if you, if you say saloon, it's something different. A saloon is something like a cantina, kind of. Oh, yeah, salon. Saloon, yeah, salon, it's a hair salon. Because, yeah, saloon will be something like a cantina, you know, a place where um, you go and, and get drinks and stuff like that. So, yeah. And then, um, I don't know if you guys know about it. I, I'm basically certain that some of you may have an idea. Uh, but there is one thing in English that is uh, known as the linking sounds. When you talk about linking sounds, what we're referring to is a characteristic of the language that allows you to create something that for many people who don't know English, who basically only um, hear English on, I don't know, the news or things like those, or maybe some videos, 
they refer to it as a chachazón. No sé si alguna vez ustedes han, han pensado eso, han eh, sentido que, o sea, alguien que habla en inglés suena como si está, como si nunca hiciera pausas, como que, si nunca dividiera, ¿verdad?, una palabra con la otra. Y eso es algo que sí sucede. O sea, es algo incluso permitido por el idioma, porque en realidad eh, se supone que eso ayuda a que eh, se hable de forma más, más rápida. Entonces, esa característica se conoce como linking sounds. ¿Por qué se los menciono? Se los menciono porque es algo, en realidad, bastante importante de saber y también aprender a hacerlo. Porque si ustedes, por ejemplo, todo el tiempo se quedan con um, decir las frases palabra por palabra y nunca nos acostumbramos a los linking sounds, nunca vamos a llegar quizás al objetivo que muchos tenemos, que es sonar como nativo, ¿verdad? Sonar naturales a la hora de hablar inglés. Entonces, una de las frases que aquí se prestan mucho para la utilización de esta característica sería esta. How would I know? Sí. How would I know? O sea, suena como si fuese una sola eh, palabra, una sola cosa, y ustedes ven que son cuatro diferentes. Entonces, how would I know? En lugar de decir how would I know, sí, decimos how would I know. Y suena mucho, mucho más fluido y pues más natural en realidad. Entonces, eso se da debido a los linking sounds. Ahora, no es algo que vamos a hacer todo el tiempo. No es como que en cada frase que yo diga, ¿verdad? Tengo que meterle así, o sea, como si fuera un linking sound. Hay momentos, hay eh, incluso palabras o frases que se prestan para ello. Por ejemplo, aquí, el uso de que acá tengo justo una W y en la siguiente palabra es una W, eso hace que se mezclen ambas eh, W y pues ya, ¿verdad? No necesito pronunciar las dos, sino que con una sola ya básicamente puedo utilizarla para la siguiente palabra. Luego, la otra cosa es que este I que está en el medio está justo en medio de dos de las letras que son como más suaves en sentido de acomodarse a otras letras. Entonces, yo digo, how would I know? Sí, en lugar de, de que suene muy pesado, diferente fuese, por ejemplo, si aquí hubiese una palabra con, que iniciara con P, ahí es distinto. Con las P es bien, bien complicado utilizar linking sounds porque son eh, letras o sonidos bien fuertes que no pueden o no permiten necesariamente el desarrollo de esa característica. Pero bueno, um, I really have no idea. En ese caso, no. What about credit cards? Esta podría ser, what about? Sí, what about credit cards? Lo de credit cards no necesariamente, pero el what about, sí, ¿verdad? O sea, en lugar de decir what about, yo puedo decir what about, ¿sí? What about, y suena mucho más fluido. Y yo sé que pueda que para algunos piensen que, o sea, para mí suena lo mismo, pero no necesariamente. Los linking sounds en serio ayudan mucho cuando se trata, ¿verdad?, de ese tipo de situaciones cuando queremos sonar más fluidos y más naturales a la hora de utilizar el idioma. Now, Um, just in a few minutes, we're going to go into practicing the conversation. You all are going to have the chance. That's going to be probably in around 10 minutes. While that happens, we're going to talk about passive, but this time it's going to be without the use of by. Last night, we talked about passive with by, and that's basically the easiest way of creating a passive voice because, well, You are actually stating the person at the end of, or stating the subject at the end of the sentence. But here, what we're going to do is that we're going to erase completely the use of a subject. So we're not going to have to mention the subject at all when we use passive without by. Now, let me tell you, this is the most common way of using passive, passive with by is normally used when you simply want to pinpoint the responsibility of something towards someone, but it's not like the most common way of using passive. Passive is, as mentioned, and as already clarified, I hope, um, is used to give more relevance to the action than to the subject. Therefore, if you mention the subject, even at the end of the sentence, you're still giving the subject some sort of um, main character vibes. So it's not completely going with the idea of using the passive or of using, you know, the passive to, um, to give actually the action more relevance because you are still mentioning the subject at some point in the conversation or in the sentence. 
Therefore, this is way better or way more suitable when you are actually doing that, when you're actually giving the um the action way more relevance than you do with the subject. So we have some uh, sentences in its act in their active voice, and then we're gonna see how they work in the passive voice. Tonight, I want to hear more examples coming from you. So please, uh, while we are doing this, um, you know, this explanation, try to go ahead and write down um examples of active sentences, and then when we hear how the passive works, you can turn some of those sentences into passive sentences as well. So we have a short definition. For the simple present, use the present of be plus the past participle. That's how it's supposed to be um, created. For the simple present, you use the present of be and the past participle. So this is basically as if it was a perfect tense to some extent. But now, the active sentences, how they're going to work. Please remember, when we talk about active sentences, it means that the subject is at the beginning of the sentence and the subject is the one that is performing the action. The subject is the one that is relevant to the sentence. When we have passive, what it means is that the action itself is the one that is important, not the subject, but the action. Now, then we have this active sentence. They use the euro in most of the European Union. They use the euro in most of the European Union. That is, that is the active sentence. In the passive, it will have to sound something like the euro is used in most of the European Union. Now, doesn't it sound as if you're probably watching like a documentary, you know, like an explanation maybe coming from um, from National Geographic or the Discovery Channel? Well, it's because the passive voice is very commonly used in those sorts of um, explanations. When you're trying to give, once again, when you're trying to point all the attention towards the action rather than pointing the attention towards the subject. So we have one more example. Um, they speak English in many European countries. This is an active one. They speak English in many, many European countries. In the passive voice, it will sound something like, English is spoken in many European countries. So here, English is the one that um, was the object before. Now, it happens to be basically the pinpoint or the starting point of the action. And it takes some sort of responsibility into the sentence itself as well. So English is spoken in many European countries. Um, of course, when you have this as the opener of a paragraph, you can start explaining the reasoning why, you can start explaining um, the story behind it, you can start explaining probably um, or giving more examples of like where is it used or maybe you can also mention what other languages are used because this is a way of you of introducing an explanation, like a longer explanation into a conversation. And now we have the last example that we have here. It's they manufacture a lot of cars in Europe. They manufacture a lot of cars in Europe. That is the active voice. In the passive voice will be a lot of cars are manufactured in Europe. A lot of cars are manufactured in Europe. Now, algo importante que sí deberíamos eh, mencionar al respecto de este tipo de oraciones es que si bien es cierto, estas de acá pareciesen ser sujetos, eh, están jugando un rol más que todo, sí de sujeto, pero... Eh, un sujeto pasivo, o sea, es un sujeto que no necesariamente puede desarrollar la acción. Entonces, por ejemplo, el euro es algo que no se va a mover por sí solo. Entonces, por eso puede utilizarse como sujeto en una oración pasiva. En cambio, si yo utilizase cualquier otro tipo de sujeto que tenga capacidad de moverse por sí mismo, de realizar actividades por sí mismo, no podría utilizarlo en la voz pasiva o como sujeto de la voz pasiva. Lo mismo sucede con el inglés. O sea, el inglés, ¿verdad? Simplemente eh, es un idioma que no necesariamente va a hacer o va a poder hacer nada por sí solo. 
sea, es utilizado por otras personas, entonces por lo mismo eh, se utilizaría o se puede utilizar como sujeto de una oración de voz pasiva. Y luego tenemos esta. Aquí sí es un poco más complejo, ¿verdad? O sea, porque eh, los carros, si bien es cierto, a raíz de que nosotros mismos los podemos conducir, pero sí son eh, objetos que tienen pues capacidad como de moverse por sí mismos, digamos, hasta cierto punto. Pero eh, el caso acá es que ellos están recibiendo, o sea, la mención de los carros está recibiendo una actividad, un, bueno, una acción que es desarrollada hacia ellos. Entonces, por eso mismo, no podríamos decir, ¿verdad?, que esto de los carros está mal usado como voz pasiva, porque pues los carros son simples receptores de la acción. Sí, entonces, a lot of cars are manufactured in Europe. Eso significa que son receptores de la, eh, de la acción y por lo tanto no necesariamente van a funcionar como sujetos completos eh, en la oración misma, sino que simplemente son como auxiliares de sujeto, por decir así, en la oración, porque pues eso es otra de las cosas, ¿verdad?, que tiene el inglés, que pues el inglés necesita que sí o sí cada oración que se escriba tenga un sujeto. Y es por eso que en muchas ocasiones ustedes se van a encontrar que hay frases que simplemente dicen, por ejemplo, um, it's raining, ¿verdad? Por decir algo, it's raining. Entonces ustedes puedan que se pregunten, ¿y por qué se dice it? O sea, ¿a qué viene eso de utilizar el it? Y a la hora de hacer una traducción, ¿dónde se coloca o cómo se traduce? Perdón. Si fuese una traducción, literal, palabra por palabra, deberíamos decir, esto está lloviendo. Sí, esto está lloviendo. Pero, como en español nosotros no tenemos ese tipo de necesidad, o el idioma permite, ¿verdad?, que se disponga de un sujeto tácito, o sea, básicamente un sujeto que no existe, eh, podemos simplemente decir, está lloviendo. Pero en inglés eso no se puede. En inglés sí o sí debe haber un sujeto al inicio de cada oración para que ésta pueda tener sentido. O sea, no se refiere a que un sujeto directo, o sea, puede haber también a veces... Eh, los que se conocen como noun phrases, que son frases que funcionan como sujeto porque mencionan en medio algún objeto que es el que o recibe o realiza la actividad, pero eso es una cosa bien, bien importante, ¿verdad? Que en inglés no existe esa capacidad de escribir oraciones como nosotros podemos hacer, eh, que simplemente decimos, eh, no sé, tengo frío, y no decimos yo tengo frío. En cambio, en inglés sí debemos decir, ¿verdad? El I am cold. O sea, si bien es cierto, tenemos la facilidad de contractarlo y simplemente decir, I'm cold, pero eh, deberíamos, o sabemos que en medio de ese contractado está el I am. Entonces, sí es casi como si yo dijera, yo tengo frío, o yo estoy, más bien, yo estoy con frío. Entonces, eh, una de esas cositas, ¿verdad? O sea, estos son necesarios, pero no necesariamente son sujetos con capacidad de desarrollar la actividad, por lo tanto, pueden ser utilizados en la voz pasiva. Muy bien, ¿alguna duda hasta acá? Ok, parece que no. Si no hay dudas, entonces ahora quiero escuchar los ejemplos. ¿Qué ejemplos podemos crear nosotros cuando se trata de hablar acerca de la voz pasiva? A ver, quisiera saber algún par de ejemplos que ustedes puedan haber o podrían pensar eh, que se desarrollen, que sean en voz activa y luego en voz pasiva, esta vez sin la necesidad de colocar un sujeto al final. Simplemente vamos a hacer lo mismo que hicimos anoche. Bueno, solo unos cuantos tuvieron la oportunidad de compartir sus ejemplos, pero lo mismo que estaban haciendo, solo que esta vez sin necesidad de colocar un by al final, sino que simplemente vamos a decir, ¿verdad? No sé. Um, Uh, Francis runs every morning. Wait, no. Um, runs three miles. Yeah, three miles every morning. Okay, so this will be an example. This is an active, an active voice. Now. In a passive, it would be, for example, three miles are run every morning. 
And here, of course, we don't need to mention who is the one um, that runs those three miles. So yeah, um, three miles I run every morning. Ahora, ¿cuáles son los ejemplos que ustedes pueden considerar en este momento? Okay, maybe let's hear from um, Julio. Can you think of an example, Julio, of a sentence that is active, but then you can turn it into a passive sentence? Currently, I'm thinking what phrases I can make. Can you give me two minutes, teacher, <laughs> to think? Sure thing. No problem. Okay. Uh, while you do that, then maybe I will give you another example here. Let's see. Um, something else you can say is, for example, um, uh, Rafael, um, Enjoys no. Uh, draws pictures of flowers. Rafael draws pictures of flowers. Okay, that's an example of an active phrase. In the passive, it will have to be something like pictures of flowers. Pictures of flowers oh, come on, are drawn. So that's how we're supposed to go. I are drawn. Oh, wait. There we go. So pictures of flowers are drawn. Okay. Aquí, como les digo, no existe la necesidad de decir como era ayer. Aquí teníamos que haber agregado, ¿verdad? By Rafael. Sí. Aquí no necesariamente. En este tipo de oraciones simplemente nos quedamos con Pictures of flowers are drawn. Ok, el caso es, el caso es que no quiero utilizar oraciones tan complejas acá en la parte superior, por eso es que también algunas de estas en pasivo, si bien es cierto, cumplen con su función de ser oraciones en pasivo, pero suenan como que no tienen mucho sentido, ¿verdad? Pero sí podría, por ejemplo, meterme con cosas más complejas como um, People in El Salvador... Uh, people in El Salvador no longer use uh, Bitcoin, for example. People in El Salvador no longer use Bitcoin. And the example that we can provide could be in the passive, something like Bitcoin is no longer... Um, Yeah, it's no longer used. Yeah, that would be. Pictorian is no longer used. Entonces, ahora, aquí, esta otra parte, sí, podría ser, ah, sí, in El Salvador. Ajá, ese es el, el sentido, in El Salvador. Entonces, de acá en adelante, podríamos empezar, como les decía, a explicar como de forma más prolongada, ¿verdad? El por qué, eh, qué está detrás de esto. Y para eso, es que se utiliza mucho, mucho lo que viene eh, dando o la función que nos viene dando el Facet Voice. Pero bueno, creo que no vamos a tener chance de practicar la conversación porque el tiempo se nos está acabando. Así que vamos a ver. Ejemplos, ejemplos. Quiero escuchar al menos unos tres ejemplos de ustedes para eh, poder terminar satisfecho. Vamos a ver. Uh, mi teacher. Ok. I have one example. Um, for example, active. Uh, Germany make Mercedes car and passive Mercedes cars are made in Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Germany makes Mercedes cars and in the passive voice, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, what? Oh, come on. There we have it. Uh, so yeah, Mercedes cars are made 
in Germany. Okay, so this one, yeah, it works. It works because uh, it basically doesn't give you a, a straight up reference to a subject because it doesn't say by Germany, it says in Germany. So it's like an explanation. And then, as I said, from that point on, you can start mentioning more details on like where's the factory or how many cars do they produce or um, maybe you can talk about the different industries in Germany. And that's the reason why the passive voice is very, very useful. And it's very common, mostly when it comes of, of to you of like doing, you know, speeches, presentations, um, it's, it's going to prove very, very useful when it comes to those situations. Now, um, one more example, please. Can I please get another uh, participant with an example? Maybe Jonathan? Or um, Blanca? Maybe you, Blanca Torres? Maybe we speak English in the night. Okay. Uh, maybe we can say the students speak English at night. And how do you think the passive of this will sound? ¿Cómo sería el pasivo de esto? Um... The yeah. English, yeah, let's una pista. Is mm -hmm. is speak. Is spoken. Is spoken. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is spoken at night. At Así night. Podría ser. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. English is spoken mm -hmm. at night. Yeah. Tenemos the students speak English at night, and here English is spoken at night. Ahora otra vez, como estas son um. Son oraciones, digamos, sencillas, no se prestan, ¿verdad?, a eso que les decía, de que, o sea, la, la voz pasiva en muchas ocasiones tiene esa, esa facilidad de poder abrir caminos diferentes a otros rumbos. Estas pueda que sea, sean oraciones que sí funcionan gramaticalmente, pero que no necesariamente cumplen una función que vaya más allá, sino que simple, simplemente se quedan ahí, ¿verdad?, en lo que son, en simples oraciones de voz pasiva, pero que no proveen esa oportunidad de ir más allá. Estas son oraciones que podríamos utilizar quizás en el caso eh, de tener una conversación un tanto eh, extraña en la que alguien nos pregunte um, ¿Es English spoken at night? Y yo le diga, yeah, es English is spoken at night. O sea, sería bien, bien raro, ¿verdad? Entonces, este tipo de oraciones así tal vez no se presten del todo al potencial que tiene la voz pasiva. Vamos a ver. Um, un ejemplo más. How about Karen? Have you thought of an example, Karen? Um, yes, I was thinking, but I'm not, I'm not sure if um, it's going to work, mm -hmm. but people in El Salvador like to eat donuts in September. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I, I'm not sure. People eating donuts in September. Or donuts, mm -hmm. donuts are eaten. Are eaten. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Are eaten in September. In September. Creo que así podría sonar mejor. O bueno, um, are eaten in September. Are eaten. Oh no 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 porque eso sería con by. Estaba a punto de decirle by Salvadorian. Uh, but no, <laughs> donuts are eaten in September. Es que sería raro también decir in El Salvador. Donuts are eaten in September. I think we, we can just leave it at that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Donuts are eaten in September. Yeah, we, we can simply leave it at that. Because it, uh, it will work. However, here, of course, this is one of those, you know, that will kind of open the road for a, a broader explanation. And mm -hmm. you will have, like, the chance, you know, to start, like, explaining why donuts are eaten in September. 
And then mm-hmm. um, you can start mentioning like, yeah, there is a promotion going on and all, all this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but uh, it works, but it's kind of tricky to create because in my case, the reason, or, I mean, I will go with the buy option. You know, I will have to say mm-hmm. um, pe- donuts are eaten by Salvadorians in September. And that way it will be like complete. Works. Like, yeah. yeah way better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. But still, the, the idea, you know, it's followed because the idea was to create sentences without using by. But if it was uh, simply to create a passive voice sentence, it would be way better. That one will be way better with the by included. With by the mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, um, so yeah, the hour kind of flew by for those who were tired. I feel like, you know, you guys are going to have the chance to go to rest now. Um, it was kind of fast, at least in my opinion, I feel it like that. Uh, but yeah, well, thank you guys very much for your attention. I hope tomorrow we're going to have the chance, you know, to uh, wrap it up with the conversation because I want you to practice that as well. I will try to type it down probably because it would be way better, you know, to see like clearer than um, with those letters. But yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a really good night and see you tomorrow. So thank you. Bye, tomorrow. guys. Welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.